Hey y'all, uh, the Dread Duck here again. One of the things I mentioned uh, that I intended to talk about on this channel is history. And today I'm going to talk not just about history, but about a particular individual um, and share a little bit of his work with you. Um, many people are aware of the Scottish poet Robert or Rabbi Burns. If you're not, I can assure you, you're familiar with at least one of his works, and you just don't realize it. Um, so Burns was born in 1759 in Scotland. Uh, the era of his birth is, is really significant to his story. So let me provide a little contextual background by going back to the beginning of that century. Uh, so at around 1700, 1707 specifically, Scotland had, through the Treaty of Union, uh, become a Union state of England. Queen Anne of uh, the House of Stuart becomes the first sovereign of Great Britain. The very next year, this fleet of French troops led by James Francis Edward Stuart, who was a, a relation, an older relation of Queen Anne, uh, sailed across to England with the intent of rallying uh, the Jacobites. Jacobites were followers of the, you know, older Stuart clan into an uprising. Nothing really came of it. He never really even landed. Uh, he just kind of went back to France. But it was a precursor to what would come in the future. Uh, 1714, Queen Anne dies, um, and the leadership of Great Britain passes to George I, or George of the House of Hanover. He's a, he was an elector of the Holy Roman Emperor um, and an Austrian, technically. Um, he became king. He didn't even speak English. So he was, throughout Great Britain, to put it mildly, unpopular. Uh, the following year, John Erskine, shout out to my Erskines out there, declared uh, James Francis Edward Stuart to be James VIII, the rightful king, um, as it should have passed to him from Anne. Um, what follows is known as the Jacobite Uprising. The Jacobites start an armed insurrection. It doesn't last long. It gets put down pretty brutally. Uh, does not amount to much. Uh, so uh, James Stewart sails back to France. Um, he winds up getting married. Um, he's now known as James the Pretender. And he, uh, he gives birth to a son. His son, Charles Edward Stuart, also known as, who will later known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. 1727, George I dies. He's succeeded by his son, George II. Again, not a very popular king, but really mostly because he and his father had been at odds their entire lives. And upon taking the throne, George II just essentially upended the aristocracy. He also, uh, you know, being uh, an elector of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, deployed British forces to the continent to fight in the War of Austrian Independence. Um, that essentially he left behind the British interests to focus on continental issues. So, in 1744, uh, the Jacobites saw this opportunity again to put Bonnie Prince Charlie on the throne, the, the, the true heir, as they saw it, of the House of Stuart. Uh, this time, uh, the uprising actually grew rapidly. There was a big movement. Charles sailed to England. He, had a, he actually amassed a fairly large army, and they were within 150 miles of London with nothing between them and the capital, but they didn't know that there was nothing between them and the capital. And they were concerned because they had been promised allies from France who had not shown up. And so they chose, rather than march on London, to retreat back to 
Scotland. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Let's launch him. So, <clears throat> they get back to Scotland, and April 16th of 1746, Prince Charlie's army is uh, caught and utterly devastated at the Battle of Culloden. Charlie would escape, and later that same year, Flora MacDonald would sail, that you may be familiar with this term, over the sea to Skye, uh, but... That comes from her smuggling Prince Charlie out of Great Britain, and eventually he would wind up in France. <coughs> the English are, to say the least, not terribly pleased with their Scottish brethren. Um, so in 1747, the Act of Proscription is passed, and that basically it's a law that prohibits the wearing of tartans or kilts except for certain Scots regiments in the military under control of English commanders. Uh, incidentally, during this period, the game of golf was invented and formalized. But anyway, uh, so 1759, Robert Burns is born. Um, the following year, George II dies. His still very much Hanover grandson, George III, ascends the throne of Great Britain. Uh, so, as Burns is growing up as a young child, there's still a lot of anti-Scots sentiment in Great Britain. Uh, 1766, uh, Fran James Francis Stewart, the old pretender now, dies in exile. And meanwhile, uh, a Scots poet by the name of Robert Ferguson, who's only nine years older than Burns, becomes widely known for the publication of his poems in the Scots language. Uh, in 1774, Ferguson died at the age of 24, uh, but he had left a significant imprint on Burns with his writings. Uh, Burns actually would later write the inscription that, was, uh, that is on Ferguson's headstone and paid to erect the headstone for what he deemed Scotia's poet. Uh, 1782, um, the act of proscription is repealed, so the wearing of tartans and kilts is once again allowed and becomes a, quite popular immediately. Uh, so what follows is this resurgence in Scottish national pride. Uh, four years later, 1786, during this ev this era of resurgence in Scott's identity, Burns publishes his first major work, Poems, this is literally the name of it, Poems, chiefly in the Scottish dialect. Um, so Rabbi Burns was a, a lover of drink and a lover of ladies, as I suppose any poet should be. Um, and he actually rose to significant fame in his own lifetime. However, he would later be shunned um, for his advocacy, his support of both the American and French revolutions and his belief in the ideas of the Enlightenment. Uh, like his inspiration, uh, Ferguson, Robert Burns would die young, uh, at the young age of 37. He passed away on July the 21st. That's a very auspicious day, as it happens to be my own birthday. Uh, in 1796, I would actually be born some years later, though, despite what some people may tell you. Uh, in his lifetime, Burns sired 12 children, and so he, it's estimated today that he has over 900 living descendants. Uh, and he is celebrated annually uh, around the world uh, in a celebration known as a Burns Supper or Burns Night. So uh, here's here's the sneaky part. I wanted to read a bit of one of his poems. Um, uh, this is one of the works that he released in 1786. It's a poem titled "Address to the Devil," or in his you know in the Scots language, "Address to the Dale." And and yes. Burns was both the, both the Mick Jagger and Keith Richardson of his era, and 
he sympathy for the devil has nothing on this. This particular work was a satire uh, intended to kind of prod and make fun of the beliefs of the Calvinists. Not me, the, those other Calvinists, John Calvin's. Uh, anyway, it, it's, uh, it's really, it's a long poem. And so I'm not going to read the entire thing. I've selected still a fairly lengthy part of it. Um, I have edited out those parts, but I will link the full text in the description below. Uh, and, and before I start, um, to all native speakers of the Scots language, I want to apologize for my accent. I mean no disrespect. I just believe that Burns' poetry cannot be fully appreciated, especially in my dialect. So, if you will allow me then. O thou, whatever title suit thee, old horny Satan Nick or Clutie, what in yon cavern grim and sooty closed under hatches, Sparges about the brunstain cutie to scold poor wretches. Hear me, old hangy, for a wee, and let poor damned bodies be. I'm sure small pleasure it can gee, e'en to a del, to skilp and scold poor dogs like me, and hear a squeal. Great is thy power and thy fame, far kinned and noted is thy name. And though yon lowen hews thy haem, thou travels far, and faith, thou's neither lag, nor lame, nor blate, nor scar. Whiles ranging like a roaring lion, for prey a holes and corners trying, whiles on the strong winded pimpus flying, turling the kirks, whiles in the human bosom prying, unseen thou lurks. I dreary, Windy winter's night, the star shot down with squinting light. Will you myself I got a fright, a yont the low. Ye like a rathbush stood in sight, with wave and so. The cudgel in my nail did shake, each bristle hair stood like a stake. When we have an eldritch stood quick, quick among the springs. Away ye scattered like a drake on whistling wings. When thou's dissolve the snowy horde, and float the jingle and icy board, then water kelpies haunt the ford by your direction, and nighted travellers are allured to their destruction. And after your moss traverse and spunkies, the coy the white that light and drunk is, the bleasing curse mischievous monkeys delude his eyes, till in some miry slaw he sunk is, ne'er mer to rise. When Mason's mystic word and grip in storms and tempests rage you up, some cock or cat your age mon stop, or oh, strange to tell, the youngest brother ye would whip off straight to hell. Lang sign in Eden the bonny yard when youthful lovers first were paired, in all the soul a love they shared the raptured hour. Sweet on the fragrant flowery sword in shady bower. And how ye get him in your thrall, and break him out of house and hall, while scabs and blotches him did gall with bitter claw, and lows did his ill tongued wicked skull, what worst of all. But are ye doings to rehearse, your wily snares and fetching fierce and that day Michael did ye appear down to this time. What ding lolling tongue or erse in prose or rhyme? And now, old clutes, I ken you're thinking. A certain bird is rent and drinking. To some luckless hour we'll send him linking to your black pit. But faith, he'll turn the corner, Jenkin, and cheat ye yet. But fare ye well, old Nicky Bin. Oh, what ye take a thought in men? Ye ablins might, I dinna ken, still he hae a stick. I'm way to think upon ye din, in for your sake. And I thank you all for the time. I hope 
that you got something from this, whatever that may be. Uh, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you.